Hi, so welcome to this, our 23rd. <laughs> it's it. No, I'm, I'm sure this is the 23rd, 23rd virtual bridge session. Um, and today we're joined with uh, Noel McDade from Northern Ireland, where it's equally sunny, I suspect. It is indeed. <laughs> Excellent. And today um, you'll be talking to us on the subject of networks, uh, especially under the current uh, situation, educational networks in the lockdown era of our lives. And so without further ado, over to you, Noel. Okay, thanks very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Yes, it is sunny and I can see blue skies. Um, let's hope it continues. It's the only thing that's keeping us sane over here at the moment. Um, it's usually gray and absolutely teeming down mm -hmm. with rain. Um, yes, um, I am Noel McDade. I'm the JISC Senior Account Manager in Northern Ireland. Um, I cover FE and HE in, in Northern Ireland and I have some residual duties um, relating to networks and I suppose you could probably call me the techie um, JISC person in, in Northern Ireland. I don't think there is. Well, I suppose there is the cybersecurity professional who's also based in Northern Ireland who does penetration testing, but let's not speak of that. Um, you're not supposed to know that. That was probably the confidential. But, um, but about myself, um, I started a career probably in 95, 96, working for an FE college in IT, um, network administration, then moved on to network engineering. So that's the network side of things before moving on to support and FE colleges in the Regional Support Centre project in Northern Ireland, where I spent quite a number of years in different various guises and roles within that, uh, moving across to more education technologies type support e-learn advisor, um, and then moving across to, to Janet um, as the customer engagement manager in Northern Ireland and in my new role as account manager slash senior account manager in JISC. So I'm taking a big assumption here that everybody knows about JISC, although slightly concerning because Kenji was having a conversation with someone as to who was JISC. So um, I'm going to take I'm going to take that assumption. The majority of you already know who JISC is. Okay. So I was asked um, to do the session last Thursday, which was cancelled at the very last minute and I think the guys um, felt sorry because I started to build slides for that session so you're stuck with me um, they, they thought it would be a good idea although much to my protestations that it was a good idea I didn't necessarily think it was a good idea but hey um, I'll, I'll try my best to, to, to kind of inform you um, about educational networks in, in, in the context of the UK um, just provide the Janet network which is the UK's education and research network um, have a look at some, not all, of the educational services that sit on top of that network. Um, how things have changed, obviously, with the current COVID crisis, the issues and challenges of that you guys face um, trying to do your jobs, how we have responded to that, and what might happen. Um, try and future gaze as, as to how things might progress and how JISC might change that because JISC is here it is a membership organization we're here to serve our membership and we serve your needs so we have to change and adapt um, on a, on a kind of ever changing um, environment so um, i'm not going to dwell too much on in terms of the services on it but i'm going to go through the janet network and a little bit about the security services that sit on top of that the uh, trust and identity, which give you access to educational resources, content, and journals. Um, the, the, the collections uh, that we do, um, which is the negotiated collections to access the journals, books, materials, and just briefly mention the vocational teaching materials that we also currently provide. Okay, the Janet Network. And I am going to get rid of my video. The Janet Network is comprised of uh, 10 points of presence. If it moves, it's supposed to be an animation. Yep, there we go. So we've got 10 core network points of presence spread out across the UK where demand- I'm not seeing any hey, no, slides, no. Yes. The slides have disappeared, haven't they? Yeah, yeah um, sorry, uh, you, you, you need to share once more. And, and you can leave your camera on. Um, we, we take a feed from your camera during the recording as well. Okay, sorry about that. That's all right. People enjoy it when a technical person, you know, something goes wrong with <laughs> also the technical has issues. Oh, yes. Can you it, see it, the screen now? We can now. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Makes us feel human. Okay. So, this is the UK, with the exception of Shetlands, which is somewhere up in the North Pole. 
okay, we can, we have 10 points of presence, which make up our core network. And, and the idea behind it is we have a distribution uh, of the network where we have a, the spine, if you, if you like, on these 10 points. And that is connected by um, several thousand kilometers of fiber, dark fiber. Uh, and these are all run at super high speeds around the network. And there's a there's a, a stat that the if you if you were to lay that fiber out um, in a straight line, it it would be enough to reach from London to Chicago. Now that's a five year old stat, so it's probably a hell of a lot more at this stage. Um, we then um, break that out into the regions. There's 19 regional distribution areas, and we have multi multiple connections into those regions for network resilience. Um, there's 900 organizations connected and there's a lot of external connectivity that goes into the network as well. And what I'm going to try and do today is give you a little bit of insight into why we do that uh, and what the benefit is to yourselves. So at the heart of it is the Janet network. Um, this diagram, you have uh, different setups in terms of HE organizations and FE organizations. And of course, the public research, because the Janet Network is a network for education and research. We are the national education and research network for the UK. Um, there's also um, other national education and research networks that do the exact same job across Europe and across the world. Um, into the Janet Network, we have over 16, or sorry, 600 Janet peerings. Now, these are external peerings into the network. Um, I have a, a, a diagram later on, um, or sorry, next, where we go into a little bit more detail in terms of the peerings and how they benefit you. But suffice to say, the, the, the Janet peerings provide um, a massive benefit in terms of saving in costs, saving in time, saving in latency. Um, as I also said, the, we are the UK's National Education Research Network. We connect to the other worldwide education research networks via Giant, and Giant is the European Federation of these NRENs. Um, it manages the connectivity to the rest of the world, be that China, the USA, uh, and so on. And then finally, whenever we don't have anything plugged into the Janet network and you want to get to some other resource throughout the, the world, we use our global internet um, connections. Now, global internet connections um, are at tier one levels. That effectively is the exact same as your BTs, your, your Virgin Medias. Um, they also use these tier one providers to get your home connections to the, the internet as well. Okay, so this is the confidential slide. Um, that um, we, we spoke about yesterday, Kenji. Um, I've removed the names um, because we don't want to demonstrate who plugs in, who doesn't plug in, and what they plug in at. I'm sorry if you hear a dog barking in the background. Um, there's probably someone at the door. Within this, we have the, the three global transit points that I spoke about just before. And this, this spider diagram um, demonstrates um, how we plug our various bits and pieces onto the network. Can everybody hear that dog? Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. I hope someone's going to deal with it now. Okay, so let's take, for example, the, um, the, 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 all these connections, right? So if you want to get to the BBC, to Google search, um, to YouTube, um, to Apple, or say Netflix, um, in a normal situation, what you would do is go out through the global peers, and whenever you go out through the global peers, you're adding additional hops because you have no control over where that actually goes. Whenever you add additional hops, you add latency into your connection, which slows that connection down. So whenever you sit in the Janet network, what we try and encourage them to do, these providers to do, is plug into the Janet network. And that's what these spikes effectively represent. All those providers, we have the BBC in there, we have the Googles in there, we have the Microsofts in there. A majority of major content providers are plugged into the network. What that does is provide us with that lower latency access to the, the, the content that they provide. It also provides us with cost saving because every megabyte that you pump out through the global transit links cost us money, effectively cost you and your organizations money as part of your just membership. Uh, I wonder, is there anything else I wanted to say about this? Uh, yeah, oh yeah. Um, as well as these content providers, 
um, we also uh, run a number of purchasing frameworks. Uh, an example of one of those would be our IP telephony services. So say your organization wanted to provide IP telephony. Um, we, when they purchase from our frameworks, we insist that these providers plug into the Janet network. Um, this is again to increase or, or lower that latency and increase that security um, for you in that service. We're effectively building the network around your needs and the services that you would want to access and encouraging them to, to plug into the network. Okay, on top of that, we have a, a number of other services. Um, one of the major ones um, that um, we, we provide is security on top of the network. Sorry, is, is someone's mic on? Thanks. Um, so uh, what I just wanted to do is highlight a couple of things we do in, on, on, in terms of cybersecurity and network security on the Janet network. We have uh, DDoS mitigation. Now, now, for those who don't know, DDoS is where um, traffic from outside of the Janet network tries to flood the network with bandwidth to try and saturate connections. So if you, if you like, if you're, you're sitting in a one gig um, connection into the Janet network, if someone from outside the network instigated a connection at one uh, gig, you don't have the ability then to use that connection for anything else but this connection trying to flood it. And what happens then is you get very, very slow connectivity and in a lot of cases that connection will be unusable and you'll be effectively down. So what we did a number of years ago after these types of cyber incidences increased was to buy in some DDoS mitigation, which we provide as part of your membership to just uh, it's funny, since the, the COVID crisis has, uh, has occurred, the number of DDoS uh, attacks on the network has, has gone down, with the exception of the last week, where we have had a number of organizations targeted in the exact same type of DDoS attack. And thankfully, we're, we're, we're now reacting to that and we've, we've dealt with that. We have a team of security professionals who are managing and looking the, and monitoring the threats on, on the network um, all the time. Um, these folks are sitting available 24-7 to react and to protect the network in quite a lot of these cases. Um, these guys will know um, what is happening to your network before you are, and the, the, the first time you know about it is when they ring you and say, we believe you have an attack. And we also provide a, a number of, of cybersecurity assessment and certification services as well. Okay, as part of that, we have a lot of negotiated deals um, under our, our collections. Um, there are also a number of other outside providers um, outside of our collections that your organizations access and probably you access as well. So these could be e-journals, these could be uh, materials um, that, are, that are on the web. Now, what we, we provide the UK Federation and the UK Federation is a trust and identity um, mechanism um, whereby we manage access to content providers with your authentication um, managed by your own local institution. Now that is a, a free to use for the uh, membership and typically what will happen is whenever you're on site um, you'll not have to log on to these services to, to get access to them whereas if you access them from home you'll maybe get a logon box to come in. That's just that is managing all that infrastructure behind to allow you to get access outside. In the old days before um, the Access Federation was there the way the, the content was accessed was only from the IP range and that is the addressing scheme of your local institutions you couldn't access it from home so that's a flexibility that it, that it provides. For those institutions that don't have the necessary skills or want to manage their access to that federation and provide you with content access, um, we have uh, services like Open Athens, which manage that whole um, system for them. And of course, quite a lot of you are probably already using Eduroam, um, which is our wireless access um, system which again is based on that uh, trust and identity scheme whereby the UK Federation is for web content and, and materials, Eduroam is for network access um, and you're basically gaining network access using your home credentials and it's a, it's a seamless process.
We also <clears throat> have started doing um, teaching and learning materials, vocational teaching and learning materials. Um, we dipped our toe in the last number of years in hairdressing and the hairdressing materials are still there. Um, we have created the, uh, these ones quite recently, which is the construction materials, digital and IT training, health and social care training and education and child care training. Now, one of the things, um, the, these are paid for services, by the way, and they are normally behind the paywall. And what JISC has done uh, is a, an immediate reaction in the aftermath of campuses closing. Um, we've removed the paywall, so at the minute you can access this content um, free and, and use it freely with your students at home. So, coronavirus hit. Um, campuses were, were, were shut down, everybody panicked, there was lots of fear about um, Quite a number of uh, universities and colleges wanted to replicate um, in class from, from home, and there was a number of issues. Um, primarily, they wanted to, FE colleges and, and, and universities were telling me that the first priority was to get the teachers um, on to um, uh, some form of teaching online. Um, that would be through Teams or Zoom or whatever the institution happened to use. And that required compute, that required laptops or desktops to be on the home premises. Um, so as you can imagine, nobody really uh, foreseen that the campuses would, would, would be shut so, so quickly. Um, whatever laptops they had were reused and redeployed. Um, laptops were ordered, there was no chance of getting them. Uh, in Northern Ireland here, we, we had a, a group of uh, public sector organizations get together and do a, a huge big procurement. There's no way they're going to get them. Um, and they still haven't got them and that's been ongoing now for six, seven weeks. Um, so they, they, they wanted to switch from, from on-premise teaching to um, learning from home. And I also heard about desktops being taken out, um, being repurposed um, and sent to, to teachers' homes. And of course, all was bliss. It was far from bliss. Um, some horror stories have, have been told to ourselves. Whenever I was doing this, I was kind of thinking, right, what's the best way to kind of describe um, the issues? And, and I just kind of plucked out a number, um, a few rather of, of use cases. So um, in, in, in my mind, um, teachers, students will access a various number of systems that are both on-premise and some of them in the cloud. What I wanted to do is demonstrate how that works in terms of the Janet network and, and how it works in the new reality as well. So in this slide here, the use cases I've, I found are quite a lot of teachers will need to access administration systems and uh, some sort of uh, register system and, uh, and access the, the MIS. There are quite a number of advanced software um, within institutions and examples being CAD and gaming environments. Now these, these software are typically very, very um, large um, compute demand on them. Uh, they're typically on PCs that, that you know, the, the normal home user wouldn't have. And of course, they're very expensive and they don't travel very well, i.e. They're, they're not available in the cloud. And of course, you have your on-premise uh, VLE or teaching application. That plugs in via your own campus network to the Janet network. And we have that layers of security, DDoS, and, and authentication and trust. And the Janet network plugs into the cloud providers, sorry, cloud providers, where you have maybe cloud-based VLEs, you have teaching content and apps, um, and you have maybe Teams, uh, Office 365, and, and Zoom. And of course, while you're on the campus network, you're in that safe, secure environment, your additional safety of the Janet network and the security it brings, and quick, quick access times um, because of the way the Janet network is set up and the way your organizational networks connect into the Janet network. So access and, for example, the VLE, uh, which is based on your home institution from home. Um, you have your device that's connected to your, your Wi-Fi and to your ISP, your home ISP, which is Virgin, Virgin Media BT or some, somebody like that. Um, whenever they use their, their uh, uh, provision, their global internet provision, that could be within the UK. And that might bounce around the UK. Uh, it might bounce off to the US. It might bounce off to multiple other comp uh, countries. And the more hops there is around the world to get back to the Janet network, 
um, the more speed is affected. Now, home users are going to be affected by speed anyway because it's going to be a fraction um, of what your institutions are connected to. But whenever you use home networks, in the absence of any uh, virtual private network that is a specific link between you and, uh, or sorry, a virtual link between you and your home institution, you have no control really of um, the path that it, that it takes. And it, it could bounce off to the States and before it comes back into the UK. Um, and onto the Janet network, there's, there, there's no way of, of knowing. It's a very similar scheme um, whenever you're trying to access, for example, Teams or Office 365 or any cloud application from home. You connect into your ISP, you could bounce around the world again, and you plug into um, that, that cloud provider. So what are the issues um, around access and campus software from, from home? So whenever you access from home, it's typically on personal IT devices um, where they have um, typically, and this, is, this isn't uh, normal, well, I suppose it is normal. Um, I've seen some horror stories from, from home as well, where there's in, in, inadequate security controls and systems and everybody in the house maybe uses the device and they're, they're uh, accessing various um, um, non too safe sites that, that maybe have um, downloaded maybe malware or, or whatever onto the devices. Um, that causes problems because whenever you access uh, content back at home, you're using a, maybe a compromised device. And again, we have speed issues. Um, now, typically what happens with uh, version or BT in the UK, um, they actually do plug into the Janet network, so they shouldn't bounce around the world. Um, but what we did notice in the aftermath of um, the campuses closing, um, our network traffic in Janet tailored off as you would expect when campuses are closed. Um, but our internet connections to, or sorry, our peer connections to the likes of Virgin Media and BT massively spiked because everybody now wanted to access their campus network from home. So what we ended up having was overloaded connections into Janet. And uh, with BT and Virgin um, teams also in a, a state of chaos as it was back in the, the, the first few days. Um, we, we really did struggle because we, we needed to upgrade our connectivity into those providers. And, and that's what I was saying earlier on about having to adapt to the new reality. And, and that's the way JISC do. And that's the, 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 the beauty we, we, we have of being able to very quickly adapt to, to change. So we corrected that problem um, within a matter of days. You also have a problem of uh, increasing the attack profile of your home campus network um, because you're having to put on, um, excuse me a second. Sorry if I had dogs again. Um, so if your attack, attack profile is increased because you're having to put applications in there now the, to allow you access for home. I spoke before about the these, these big applications like CAD and um, and the gaming um, engines, gaming systems, um, what they're typically doing and, and what the immediate thing they did was create um, uh, devices or virtual devices on campus that um, staff and students could access um, like it was a, like they, they were residing on the network and they hadn't been secured properly and hadn't been planned properly. It was a knee jerk reaction and that certainly increased the attack profile, but it increased the vulnerabilities because a lot of these things had undiscovered vulnerabilities which came to light. And hackers on the web were, were certainly exploiting them. Okay, I, I, I'm, I, I've been watching this website as well. It's the Cyber Threat Coalition, which is a, a collection of cyber professionals um, who are constantly looking at the cyber threats um, in relation to what is changing um, in, the, in the current COVID um, uh, climate. And they've seen a, a massive spike in, in scams and, and attempts to fish um, credentials, um, as seen in the, 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 the diagram here. Now, the, the scam topics are also quite interesting and it, it, it is the um, change in nature of, of the way they're, they're, the, these uh, scammers are trying to attack using people's insecurities and fears. And, and it certainly was all around the information about COVID-19, uh, PPE is, a, is, a, is another one. So they're, 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 the security threats are changing and they're, they're trying to exploit human nature. As I said before, network demand is, is certainly tailored off since the campuses have closed. Uh, the diagram here on the left shows um, 
the, the weeks leading up to Easter 19 and this year. And it was following a normal pattern until the crisis hit and then it just dropped off and demand tailored off. Edgerome authentication is also tailored off and, and that's, that's certainly what we, what we would expect. So how Jessica has responded, we provide, uh, we immediately um, set ourselves about creating a range of support and looking at ways where we could quickly have impact uh, with our membership. And the first thing was to um, create a number of uh, webinars and, and information to allow uh, managers, to allow teachers, to allow technical people um, to get access to JISC's expertise, to, to help them along the, the, the journey and, and to, to help them if, if incidents occur. As I said before, we're, we're, we've, reshaped the, uh, we've reshaped the network and we are continuing to reshape the network based on what these uh, new needs might be. We've stepped up our security monitoring um, uh, as well. And of course, if, if needs be, we, we will um, support and increase support for research um, and primarily in research around the coronavirus, which UK institutions are heavily engaged in our research institutions. And we're also prioritizing and working with institutions to, to reorganize work um, around the network as well. We provide a number of free courses or, or webinars um, listed here and they are on our, our, our website might be of interest to you. And as I said before, we've removed the uh, vocational materials paywall and that's up to the end of July this year. So what does the, the future look like? Um, it's an it's extremely difficult one to, 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 to see. We're, we're hearing um, that uh, some of the restrictions will be loosened up, but how far and how deep that'll go, we, we, we just don't know. Um, even if we do get some partial opening again and, and staff are allowed back into campuses and, and, and allowed to practice social distancing, are there any guarantees that there will be more lockdowns in the future? How will you know, organizations react to that? Will they have proper plans in place? Have we learned any lessons from the last number of weeks? Will there be travel restrictions on our students still, on our staff getting to and from work? Will there be more homework and, um, and learning from home? Um, or will we revert back to the way we were before? Um, will colleges and, and universities embrace you know, the, the kind of hybrid way of teaching, um, dare I say, in blended learning? We've been harping on about it for quite a number of years, um, but this seems to have uh, kicked things on. And will we make more use of, of cloud technologies? This slide is just looking at where I think things are going to change in the immediate uh, future anyway, or if we have multiple logons. So um, I, I think we're, we're, we're going to get um, more movement um, in the future between home and, and, uh, and in the campus. And not just on the teacher side, I, I, I see this on the, the, the learner side as well. Um, maybe we could end up having laptops for all providers, uh, or sorry, all learners and they'd be able to use that on the network and at home. Um, I also see the administration systems and uh, all these other applications that are currently sitting on the home network to move into the cloud. That means cloud providers are gonna get bigger and provision is gonna get bigger. And I can see the Janet network having to change to, to uh, point more towards the cloud. We could probably see that the campus network estate will change to being more uh, about um, authentication and identity and be more about tutorial workshops and socializing. So how will Jessica and Janet react to that? Um, in, ter in terms of the cloud and making the, the move to the cloud, we can, we can certainly help with that. Um, could we create maybe a just cloud? Who knows? We could certainly do deals um, for software and applications that, um, that our membership um, need in, in the future, and maybe we could develop our own. Um, we're certainly gonna increase the ISP bandwidth from home, and we're already starting to do this and have done this. Um, we could um, look to create um, home-based VPNs, um, use just net paths, for, for example. Um, or maybe in the future, we could have Janet at home. Uh, maybe in our, our own right, we could um, allow ourselves to, to, to become uh, a home Janet provider. 
um, provide that high-speed broadband access, have it secure and have it education focused. Um, who knows? So I suppose that, that kind of wraps it up for me. Um, how long we have? It's about 20, 22 minutes or, or, or thereabouts. And I just want to know, is, is, is there any questions or comments? Yeah, no, no. Thanks for that. That's um, we, we're we're almost up at the end of our time, but we do have some some time for questions. Does anyone have a a, a question for for quite a range of things that uh, that Noel's brought up there? Have I bored you all completely? <laughs> Always takes a second to find that unmute button. <laughs> Can I challenge Noel to come up with the shortest description of these techie terms? Dark fiber, first of all. Dark fiber. Um, okay, so uh, all connectivity, network connectivity these days is run across fiber networks. Okay, so whenever we go to BT or Virgin and purchase, um, say, a one gig connection, um, what typically happens is we rent space across their fiber. So the Virgin BT uh, will light that path and we take a chunk of that light. Um, in the dark fiber, we take the whole spectrum. So we buy the full fiber and nobody's on that fiber by ourselves. Okay. Uh, how about peering? What does peering mean? I thought I described peering. Uh, maybe I kind of um, missed the whole point. So peering is where we bring um, connections from non-membership into the network. Um, that is the BBCs, that is the Googles, that's, that's all those content providers that um, we want to have and normally go through global transit. We bring them closer to the network. We also, of course, peer with SWAN. Thank you. Okay, I, I know we have time for at least uh, one more question. I know Jamie works in a tech, technical role at West College Scotland. Um, Jamie, do you have a, a, a question? <laughs> Um, well, there's obviously so many points. Um, obviously, I'm working from the IT side rather than the e-learning side, so a lot of these are pitched in the e-learning audience, so it's good to have a, a bit of a balance here. Um, the one thing I can relate to particularly is obviously you're saying about moving services off-prem, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the cloud being the kind of consumer technology for that, uh, consumer terminology for that. Uh, we're looking at moving SharePoint, uh, moving from SharePoint on-prem 2013 to obviously SharePoint online. Uh, we're looking at moving, obviously, VLEs as well, uh, actually starting with our commercial clients who are private companies um, who uh, uh, procure Moodle services from us, essentially, under contract. Mm -hmm. um, like then we forward as the guinea pigs. And, um, obviously, it's quite transparent to staff. I mean, staff only care where it's based if it's if that's a result. The result of that is that it, it stops working. Yeah. Um, they just see it all, it's all been on the internet, even the, the on-campus resources. Yeah. Um, it's kind of the, the the main kind of struggle we had actually was, um, and they don't. Not everyone has direct access. It's only IT and uh, specialist power users, um, uh, including myself, that have got direct access connections to the domain controllers, and um, they were saving things on Windows network shares, and then not realising that um, Windows network shares went equivalent to uh, OneDrive, i.e., external accessible. Um, even though they kind of been briefed on it, it's just it's it's getting that message to sink in that there is this um, that, that there are things that are only achievable on site. Um, many users that have worked from home before, but um, only uh, to fill in gaps, not as a working from home all the time. Yeah. And the one thing that Kenji touched on was um, obviously um, we've not had a dry run for this, not to this scale. We've maybe had slight closures for weather events and things like that the last a week or so, but not this continued working from home, both for staff and for students. Um, there's obviously a, there's a concern in our organisation about um, what the return time for support staff, uh, professional staff, as they're called universities, as opposed to teaching staff and students. But um, I suppose it, it shouldn't really matter. I'm, I'm, I don't know, this isn't more a statement rather than a question, but mm. uh, I suppose the question would be uh, more what your experience at JISC is of seeing services move from on-prem uh, to cloud or off-prem hosting and whether that's been a rush job or whether it's been a well-planned out process. 
Well, um, I suppose it's it's been a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, I've, I've seen FE certainly push quite a lot of services into the cloud over the last number of years. They, they, they seem to be kind of talking about cloud first. They, they typically don't have the, the, the money to build big data centers and refresh data centers um, to house these things. And of course, skill sets are, are, are getting squeezed, you know, in, in major cities and, and, and places. Um, on the HE side, um, I, I've seen management want cloud first and and you know out, out with you know the idea of a pandemic they've, they've wanted there's been a desire to move more things into the cloud but there's been resistance from within he um, IT teams uh, there seems to be a bit of a culture of wanting to see flashing lights and, and having the tin there um, and, and of course we have you know other issues of finance departments like to spend capital as opposed to reoccurring budgets which is another issue you know we could talk about for hours um, uh, as well but um, I think this current crisis has has caught quite a lot of people on the hop. Yes, we have seen some move towards these these things moving in the cloud. I think there's a realization that um, things like this are going to happen more frequently in the future, and we need to plan for home based. Yes, the default is to have you know people on prem, but we have to plan for continuation of service for our own survival or our own existence and I think there's going to be a bigger drive now to move to the cloud and, and I suppose that's where Jess can help I mean you mentioned a couple of issues there um, where you're you're kind of moving things across you know we, we could certainly bring consultants in to, to kind of work with you on what the best schemes are um, what's worthwhile doing and, and and how to how to move those projects forward. Okay, and uh, th thanks for that. And for those joining us um, via the recording, um, that, that brings us to the end of the recorded session. Um, hopefully you'll be able to join us for another virtual session. Thanks to Noel and thanks for everyone here for contributing to the discussion. And uh, until then, stay safe.